Example 9.3.5, IRR, or internal rate of return, and delayed investment. Okay, this one's going to have a really similar setup to the previous example, 9.3.4, where we had multiple internal rates of return. Um, we're going to change up the cash flows a little bit, although they'll look really similar to where we only have one internal rate of return. But this is still an interesting problem because it does change how we use the internal rate of return. So let's work through, th through this one and see what happens. A military commander who was involved in several famous incidents in the global war on terror has just retired. A publishing company has offered to pay him $1.1 million today to spend the next three years writing a book about his experiences. Accepting this opportunity means that the author will give up lucrative speech opportunities over the next three years while he works on the book. He expects that he could make $550,000 per year giving speeches over the next three years if he does not accept the publishing opportunity. The author estimates that 10% is a reasonable, reasonable cost of capital for this project. What is the net present value of this project? And what does the NPV rule say about this project? What is the IRR of this project? And what does the IRR rule say about this investment? Should the commander accept the publishing deal? Okay, so we're going to solve for both NPV and IRR. So we'll start by setting up the timeline. And we want to do that for multiple reasons, even though we know with multi cash flows like this, it's going to be challenging, if not just too time consuming to be worth it, to solve for IRR using the equations. Um, so we're going to go right for the, the calculator. However, we still want to draw out the timeline just to make sure we get the timing of each one of these cash flows right and so that we can inspect it for the potential for multiple internal rates of return. So with this one, we're going to look at it, we're going to map it out from the perspective of accepting the publishing deal. And the cash flows from that perspective would be a cash inflow of $1.1 million today, followed by three cash outflows of $550,000 per year over the next three years, because this author would have to give up those speaking opportunities to work on the book if he takes the $1.1 million up front. And that's it. The previous one had another cash inflow at the end of the timeline. That's gone on this one. So the cash flows only change direction or change signs one time. We go from positive at time period zero to negative at time period one, and then it stays negative for the rest of the timeline. Now, there is an interesting difference here from what we would consider a traditional cash flow structure for an investment. Typically, with when you're looking at making some sort of investment, there will be a cash outflow up front where we buy the equipment or the land or whatever we need, we need whatever it is we need to invest in the project, and then we would project cash inflows over the life of the project. Well, the direction of these cash flows are exactly reversed. With this particular project, the author is going to get paid up front, but then has to give up those speaking opportunities. So those $550,000 costs are, are real opportunity costs for him that he's going to have to give up if he decides to take this $1.1 million. Well, what we're going to find out is that the internal rate of return investment rule is actually dependent upon the structure of the cash flows. And when we reverse it like this, it's actually going to reverse how we use the internal rate of return rule. So let's go after both of these. We're going to use the cash flow worksheet, which was introduced in example 9.3.3. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through this. Um, if you haven't gone through that introduction yet, where I go a little bit slower, go back and check out 9.3.3, where we calculate the NPV and the IRR over a multi-year project. Um, and that one will go kind of slower step by step and explain what's going on with the cash flow worksheet. This one, I'm just going to assume um, that you've had a couple of reps with it and we can move a little bit quicker. So I'm going to open up the cash flow worksheet. Of course, the last problem I worked is still in there. So I want to zero everything out by hitting not compute, but second and clear work the bottom left. And that should put zeros on everything. I like to hit it twice just because I'm paranoid about it actually clearing out or not. And then I want to enter this timeline just exactly as it appears. So cash flow zero is the cash flow that happens at time period zero. That's going to be an inflow of 1.1 million. So we'll type that in. And then make sure and press enter to store that value on CF zero. And then I can hit the down arrow key to go to the next entry, which is CO1. C01 is that first cash flow after time period zero. And in this example, that is a cash outflow of 550,000. So I'm going to type in 550,000, push the plus minus key to make it negative, and then press enter to store it. And I'll see 
the signs of an entered value, my sideways triangle, decimal, and equal sign that I'm always looking for popping up after each one of these so that I know that it's stored. Okay, so we put minus 550,000 there. And then I'll hit the down arrow key to go to the next entry, which is going to be F01. And that stands for the frequency of that cash flow that we put on the cash flow one key. With this one, we get a $550,000 cash outflow three times in a row. So we can set F01 equal to three by putting in, typing in three, and then pressing enter to store it. All right, and since we told it that we're gonna get three cash flows of 550,000, we have entered the full timeline for this particular project. Now I like to go ahead and hit the down arrow key three times after the last entry just to make sure there's really nothing else in there. Cash flow two is a zero, frequency of two is a zero, and if I hit it a third time, it should go back to cash flow zero, and it does, so now I'm sure that there's nothing else in it. All right, so now let's get the net present value and the internal rate of return. So I'm, it doesn't matter which one you do first, I'm gonna start with the net present value. When I press the NPV key, of course it asks for a discount rate because it needs to put everything in time period zero dollars for it does a subtraction. And we're told in the problem that the author believes 10% as a reasonable cost of capital. So I'll type in 10, press enter to store it on the I, and then you can hit the up or down arrow key to get back to net present value. And once we get back to net present value, we have the compute prompt. The calculator has enough information. We can go ahead and hit the compute key or CPT and find that we have a net present value of minus 267,768 dollars and let's just call it 60 cents. All right, so that is a negative NPV. The NPV rule says reject. As rejecting it is the equivalent of paying out $267,000, almost $268,000. All right, with the NPV rule, we accept any positive net present value projects and reject negative net present value projects. Now let's get the internal rate of return. And we can get the internal rate of return while we're in the cash flow worksheet. We just press the IRR key and then compute. It doesn't need any information about a discount rate because it's going to solve for that rate. And we're getting an internal rate of return of 23.3, let's just call it 38%. All right, now remember how the IRR rule works. With the IRR rule, we accept projects when the rate of return, the internal rate of return, is greater than the cost of capital. So in this case, the IRR of 23.38% is in fact greater than the cost of capital of 10%. So traditionally, the IRR rule, IRR rule would say, hey, it's costing you 10% to use this money, or that's your opportunity cost, and the project is expected to return 23. almost 4%. So the IRR rule, traditionally interpreted, would say accept. So we've got confusion here. The NPV rule says we should reject the project. The IRR rule says we should accept the project. So what is going on here? Well, first of all, we'll say that anytime you have a disagreement between the NPV and IRR rules, assuming you've set everything up correctly, you would follow the NPV rule. Right? The IRR rule has enough issues with it that when there's disagreement, we would just um, we would trust the NPV before we trusted the internal rate of return rule. Now, what is going on with this one? Why are we getting different answers with the two different rules? We saw how closely they are related, right? Internal rate of return is just the rate at which net present value equals zero, and it's interpreted as a rate of return for the project. So anytime the internal rate of return is greater than the cost of capital, that should be equivalent to saying we have a positive net present value project. Well, in this case, it is not, and here's why. If we were to build, go into Excel, put these cash flows in, and then solve for the net present value at a range of different discount rates, we get a different looking net present value profile than a traditional project 
um, where a traditional project has cash outflows up front, followed by cash inflows over the life of the project. Right? And we saw in an earlier example, if we have cash inflows, followed by cash outflows, followed by cash inflows, we get this U shape and we get multiple internal rates of return. Well, with this one, if we just reverse the typical direction of the cash flows, what happens is we flip the net present value profile over the x-axis and it's just um, it's rotated over the x-axis so that it's um, going the opposite direction from what we're used to seeing. In this case, now anytime we have a discount rate, right, that's what's tracked on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, anytime we have a discount rate that is less than the internal rate of return, right, and think about the, the flip side, the way we usually interpret, interpret the internal rate of return rule says that anytime we have an internal rate of return greater than the cost of capital, that should be a project we accept. Well, in this case, here we see that if the internal rate of return is greater than a discount rate between zero and say 23.38%, this is actually a negative net present value project and we would reject it. Whereas if our cost of capital was anything above, was anything greater than the internal rate of return, right? Which means our internal rate of return is less than the cost of capital. It's actually a positive net present value project. And so we would want to accept it. Okay, so the mechanical sort of everyday interpretation of this is if you see a cash flow structure that's exactly reversed from the typical, that is you've got a cash inflow followed by a series of cash outflows, the net present value rule still works. You interpret it just like normal. The internal rate of return rule is actually reversed this normal interpretation where we'd accept projects where the internal rate of return is greater than the cost of capital is not right. That's not what we want to do, right? Because the rule is reversed, we see the internal rate of return is greater than the cost of capital. That's actually a place where we would want to reject the project, right? Because we find ourselves right about here right? 10% cost of capital. Our net present value is a minus 267, almost $268,000, right? So that's definitely a rejection here. So we just reverse the IRR rule or don't use it together, whichever way you want to go because the MPV rule still works. But this is something we want to be careful of um, when we're relying on just the internal rate of return rule and know how to interpret that for the different types of cash flows you might find.